Hello, my name is Dr. Kristen Smith, and I'm an attending physician and clinical assistant professor of emergency medicine at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you for joining the Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion section of AEM for this lecture series. Today, we will be discussing abdominal pain. Before I get into the lecture, I want to let you know why I love emergency medicine and maybe some of the reasons why you love it too. It was during my third year of medical school during a rural EM rotation that I got to learn about emergency medicine. Emergency medicine is really all about caring for the undifferentiated patient. So patients will come in with a variety of symptoms and you have, a, have to correlate this along with their physical exam to figure out what's going on and develop a diagnosis. Also in the emergency department, we get to do a variety of procedures ranging from laceration repairs, lumbar punctures, intubations, and I find that exciting and also a way to practice emergency medicine by using tactile skills. Lastly, the emergency department is critical pr to providing access to care for so many patients. The emergency department is one of the only healthcare settings that is open 24 seven, rain or shine, weekend, holiday, doesn't matter, and it allows patients to access care many of whom would be unable to access care anywhere else. Outside of my clinical interest in emergency medicine, I have an interest in health equity education, specifically developing skills-based and practical approaches to implementing health equity education into emergency medicine training and clinical sim scenarios. This is a long slide to just give you the objectives of what, of what you will learn today. But basically it says that by the end of this lecture, you'll be able to rock the patient presenting with abdominal pain and know exactly what your plan is and list some of the most emergent differentials that you need to consider in the ED. So abdominal pain in the emergency department. 10% of patients who present to the ED come in with abdominal pain. Abdominal pain diagnoses can range from benign to life-threatening. Most ED physicians find abdominal pain a challenging presenting symptom due to the large number of possible etiologies. For 25 to 40% of patients presenting with abdominal pain, a specific diagnosis is never confirmed due to an unrevealing workup. Given the frequency of patients presenting for abdominal pain, it is an important chief presenting symptom to master. Some of your can't miss abdominal pain diagnoses that we'll discuss during this lecture are aortic dissection, small bowel obstruction, mesenteric ischemia, myocardial infarction, and ruptured ectopic pregnancy. Common abdominal pain diagnoses include cholecystitis, appendicitis, diverticulitis, pancreatitis, gastritis, or gastroesophageal reflux disease, colitis, urinary tract infection, UTI, or sexually transmitted infections, STIs. So during your clinical rotations in the emergency department, the presenting symptoms or chief complaint will help to focus your history taking, physical exam, and workup. Given the brief triage history that's listed here, which is a 45-year-old woman presenting with diffuse abdominal pain for the last three days associated with nausea and vomiting, what other information would you like to gather from the patient? Right, you should be considering things like location, of the pain, how does the patient characterize the pain, when was the onset, are there any exacerbating or remitting factors, and any associated symptoms such as chest pain, shortness of breath. So in the ER, you should always be thinking whether your patient is sick or not sick. This is really meaning how acute is their presentation. More acute means unstable vitals, pain are out of proportion to exam, less acute as stable vitals, a patient may be comfortable and you may be able to complete a full history, get a thorough exam. Whereas patients who have unstable vitals, you wanna make sure that you are stabilizing your patient first. 
So a key to working up patients in the ED is stabilization, which is assessing first ABCs, which are airway, breathing, and circulation. Signs of an unstable patient presenting with abdominal pain may include unstable vitals, so bradycardia, hypotension, tachypnea, diaphoresis, severe abdominal pain, or pain out of proportion to their examination, or uncontrollable vomiting. You should look for signs of peritonitis, which is inflammation of the lining of the intra-abdominal organs and intra-abdominal wall, which usually indicates a higher acuity and higher likelihood of having to go to surgery, a surgical abdomen, right? So peritonitis is essentially a sur surgical abdomen. Signs include severe tenderness to palpation, rebound, guarding, rigidity, inability to tolerate movement. So sometimes this can be elicited by the tap stretcher test. So when you're you know, examining the patient, you can tap the end of the stretcher and see if the patient jumps off the bed or they have worsening of their abdominal pain. That can indicate if they have a peritonitic abdomen. A way to elicit this on history taking is by asking the patients, when you either took the bus here during your ride or during your car ride, were you particularly sensitive to every bump in the road? Did you notice every speed bump? And did going over these bumps make your abdominal pain worse? If they answer yes, you may have a higher clinical suspicion for a peritonitic abdomen. <clears throat> so with all chief complaints and symptoms, you wanna make sure that you're doing a thorough physical exam. When examining a patient coming in with abdominal pain, your order of how you perform the physical exam matters. So you wanna inspect, auscultate, percuss, and palpate. Now I'll be honest, <laughs> it's rare that I am percussing the abdomen, but according to the textbooks you said, so that is how you're being taught. And when you're palpating the abdomen, you wanna make sure that you have the patient lying supine because lying upright or at an angle can induce voluntary guarding and can really limit your exam. So it's best to have the patient supine with their inter, their intra-abdominal muscles, their rectus abdominal muscles totally relaxed so that you can get a good exam. So when you're formulating your differential diagnosis, you usually think of the funnel method or the tunnel method where you start off with a multitude of differentials and then as you collect your history, and perform your physical exam, you start to narrow and taper down your differential. When working a patient up for abdominal pain, it's important to think about the different areas of the abdomen and you can use the four quadrant method. So based on the quadrants of the abdomen, you think about what organs are located in this area which may key you into a certain diagnosis. So in the right upper quadrant, you're thinking about gallbladder disease, liver disease, maybe small bowel diseases. So cholelithiasis, cholecystitis, cholangitis, hepatitis, hepatic cirrhosis. You may even wanna consider, could this be a right lower lobe pneumonia or pneumothorax on the right side that's masquerading as abdominal pain? So it's important to, to think about the different organs that are related to the quadrants. For the left upper quadrant, you wanna think about your spleen, your stomach, and some of the small bowels. So think about differentials such as peptic ulcer disease, GERD, splenic infarcts, left lower, uh, excuse me, left lower lobe pneumonias and um, atypical ACS. Although it's not one of the quadrants, you want to think about the epigastrium and your periumbilical region. So sometimes patients who have pancreatitis, atypical ACS, peptic ulcer disease, they may come in with pain or burning at their epigastrium. Once you get into the lower quadrants, you then want to start considering not only intra-abdominal pathology, but also intrapelvic pathology. So you want to be thinking about on your right side, usually right lower quadrant of abdominal pain, we automatically think of appendicitis, but you also want to be thinking about right-sided diverticulitis, epicolic appendagitis, 
colitis, small bowel obstruction, ovarian or testicular torsion, ovarian cyst or a ruptured ovarian cyst, inguinal hernia, you really wanna have a broad differential. When thinking about the left lower quadrant, you wanna think about pathology such as diverticulitis, diverticulosis, colitis, enteritis, new onset colon cancer, <clears throat> Again, ovarian or testicular torsion, peptic inflammatory disease, all of these can identify as left lower quadrant pain. When performing a physical exam for a patient who presents with abdominal pain, you want to make sure that you're also assessing the flanks, the flanks as well. So you want to be taking a look at the patient's skin and again, looking for those signs of um, pancreatitis, intra-abdominal hemorrhage that we talked about, the ecchymosis of the flanks, which is gray Turner sign or Cullen sign, ecchymosis of, the, of around the umbilicus. But beyond doing your skin exam, you also want to make sure that you're palpating or percussing the flanks to see if that elicits any pain as well. Flank pain can sometimes be an indication of a multitude of pathologies. Usually immediately we think of either pyelonephritis, which is inflammation of the kidney, right, from um, an ascending uh, urinary tract infection versus nephrolithiasis, so your kidney stones, perinephric abscess can cause flank pain. Also, all of your intra-abdominal pathology can actually present as flank pain, so small bowel obstruction, colitis, enteritis. And you also want to consider a patient who comes in with um, flank pain on one side, so unilateral flank pain, hematuria, so blood in their urine. Beyond just kidney stones, you also want to think about aortic dissection, right? Because that can be a sign. These symptoms can be a sign of aortic dissection as well. So you want to make sure that you don't miss that diagnosis. So it's important when you're thinking about your differential for patients who present with abdominal pain, you're gonna have a very broad differential and you can start to kind of narrow things down or place things higher on your differential or lower on your differential based on where the patient's tenderness on exam localizes. So part of a thorough physical exam for a patient presenting with abdominal pain also includes performing a genitourinary exam. It's important when you are going to perform a genital urinary exam before the exam, you ask up front, you ask your patient how they prefer their reproductive or organs to be referred to. So whether they want you to use you know, ovaries, testicles, or whatever language that they prefer, you can get that out of the way to make sure that you're using patient preferred language. Before you perform any type of genital urinary exam, you also need to ask for permission. You don't have to get a written consent form or anything like that, but you do need to verbally ask the patient, first of all, if they're allowing you to do the exam, but you also need to explain why they, why they need to have the exam done and specifically what are the specifics of the exam, and then also make sure that they consent to having this particular exam performed. And then lastly, you want to make sure that you have a chaperone. So whether getting one of your emergency technician colleagues or nursing colleagues into the room with you before you do the exam. And because you're a medical student, you want to make sure that you have your senior resident and your attending physician or the attending physician in the room with you as well. <clears throat> So now that we discussed some of the key ways and things that you need to be thinking about when you're performing a physical exam on a patient presenting with abdominal pain, we want to get into some of the specific physical exam findings that may clue you into a certain diagnosis. So some of the specific signs include McBurney's point. So tenderness at McBurney's point is pathognomonic for appendicitis. And if you remember, if you draw a line from the umbilicus to the anterior superior iliac spine, McBurney's point is located 
one third away from the ASIS and two thirds away from the umbilicus. If you palpate that area and you elicit exquisite tenderness, you can be concerned that this patient has appendicitis. So Murphy sign is pathognomonic for cholecystitis, and it's elicited by asking a patient to inspire while palpating right beneath the right costal margin. If inspiration is arrested when you're palpating, then that is a positive Murphy sign. So robbing sign, psoas sign, and obturator sign are all also signs that are pathognomonic for appendicitis. So if you remember, robbing sign is when you palpate the left lower quadrant, and that elicits pain in the right lower quadrant of the patient. Psoas sign is with passive extension of the right hip causes right lower quadrant pain. Obturator sign is when flexion and internal rotation of the right hip causes right lower quadrant pain. And again, these are all pathognomonic for appendicitis. In addition to performing a thorough exam through palpation, you want to make sure that you're examining your patient's skin for patients presenting with abdominal pain. So here we see two skin findings that can be linked to intra-abdominal pathology. Up top, we see Cullen sign, and down at the bottom, we see Gray Turner sign. So Cullen sign is ecchymosis around the umbilicus. So here's the umbilicus on each patient, and you can see the ecchymosis. And then Gray Turner sign is ecchymosis of the flank. So these signs can be indicative of a multitude of diseases, most notably pancreatitis, a ruptured ectopic pregnancy, or retroperitoneal intra-abdominal hemorrhage. So obviously, if you see these signs on a patient, you have more concern that they have an acute abdomen and they need, may need emergent surgery. If you look here, it's important to note that the ecchymosis looks different based on whether the patient has a lighter skin tone versus a darker skin tone. Looking at the lighter skin tone, you see that the ecchymosis may look more bluish green or red in color. And then on your um, right side, you may see that the ecchymosis looks more blackish, purplish in color. So that's important to note as well. And again, just being reminded of our can't miss abdominal pain diagnoses, they include aortic dissection, small bowel obstruction, mesenteric ischemia, myocardial infarction, and ruptured ectopic pregnancy. And some of the common abdominal pain diagnoses include cholecystitis, appendicitis, diverticulitis, pancreatitis, gastritis, or GERD, colitis, UTI, or STI. And we'll discuss these in specifics after we discuss just general workup. So now that you've performed a thorough history and physical exam on your patient, hopefully, you have um, a plan for how you wanna work up the patient to diagnose and treat the patient. So in the emergency department, a key to coming to the correct diagnosis is having, again, starting off with that broad differential and using a tunnel or a funnel technique where you start off with a broad differential and then you start to narrow things down and determine what's going on with the patient. The tests you order, such as labs and imaging, should either confirm or did not deny a diagnosis that you already think is going on. So based on your history and your physical exam, if you do a good job with taking a thorough history and you do a thorough exam, you really should have the diagnosis right there. Labs and imaging studies are just used to confirm or deny your differential. So you may want to start out with getting some labs on your patient. For all persons with functioning ovaries and uteri, you want to get a pregnancy test because this will delay giving certain medications like NSAIDs if the patient is pregnant or getting a CT scan. So you want to do that right away and get that off the table. Also, it helps you to refine your differentials. So a patient who comes in with a positive pregnancy test with acute onset abdominal pain 
they are a ruptured, this person has a ruptured ectopic pregnancy until proven up otherwise. Some other labs that you may wanna consider are a complete blood count, basic metabolic panel, or a complete metabolic panel, which includes your LFTs, bilirubin. Um, you may wanna get a separate lipase, venous blood gas. If the patient has signs or symptoms of infection, you may wanna get blood cultures. And if the patient has a peritonitic abdomen and you're concerned that they are going to need emergent surgery, you wanna go ahead and order your pre-op labs, which are type and screen and coagulation studies right away. Also, don't forget your urine analysis. So <clears throat> that can help to diagnose a urinary tract infection or other diseases. Other tests that you may wanna consider that isn't necessary for every single person, every single patient, presenting with abdominal pain include troponin, stool studies or stool cultures for those patients who have a history of being immunocompromised or have a unique travel history or camping history. And I always have a low threshold for STI testing in the ED. I usually ask patients during, when I'm gathering a history, if they have any signs or symptoms of STIs, but as we know, some STIs have no symptoms at all. So I usually just ask the patient straight up, hey, would you like a, would you like to be tested for STIs today? And I explained to them that we could test for gonorrhea, chlamydia, trichomoniasis, what have you. And usually I let the patient um, decide unless I have a very, very high clinical suspicion. So for your patients who are unstable, meaning they have unstable vitals or their pain is out of proportion or they're in so much pain that they cannot get comfortable, you really should be leery of getting advanced imaging such as sending the patient to CAT scan without them being stable, right? You, sh you shouldn't do that. You definitely don't do that in the, in the emergency department. So you wanna make sure that you use your bedside tools, which are bedside ultrasound, and also sometimes um, usually you can easily get an upright chest X-ray or abdominal film to start getting your workup going without actually having the patient leave the emergency department to get imaging. So here we see a upright chest X-ray where the patient has what are signs of pneumoperitoneum. So this is air under the diaphragm bilaterally. And so this has us concerned, when you see this finding, it's concerning for perforated the interabdominal viscous. So here is an upright abdominal X-ray. And as you see here, you see large dilated loops of bowel and air fluid levels, which is concerning for small bowel obstruction. For so this patient, you'd wanna make sure that you're getting the patient's pain under control quickly. If the patient came in with any signs of peritonitis or you have a concern that they may have small bowel with some perforation or infectious symptoms, you wanna go ahead and get antibiotics on board and start calling your surgical colleagues and getting an NG tube in place. An NG tube for patients with small bowel obstruction, the concern is usually these patients are vomiting quite a bit and they are a high risk for aspiration. So you wanna go ahead and place the NG tubes to, tar to, start, to, to start decompressing the abdomen and the GI tract. So as you all probably know from rotating in the emergency department, Having skills in bedside ultrasound is so critical and it really hastens us to get to a diagnosis quicker and, and that's awesome. So an ultrasound that you're going to be very comfortable with graduating from an emergency medicine residency is performing right upper quadrant ultrasound. So right upper quadrant ultrasound is used to diagnose biliary pathology. And um, really what you're looking for is signs of acute cholecystitis, and there are five signs indicative of acute cholecystitis on a right upper quadrant ultrasound. The first is seeing a gallstone. So you see this hyperechoic structure here in the middle of the gallbladder with acoustic shadowing, which is indicative of a stone. <clears throat> the next is a thickened anterior gallbladder wall. So if you have a ruler, you can then um, measure out the anterior gallbladder wall. If that is greater than three millimeters, then that is a thickened wall. You wanna look for signs of pericholocystic fluid. You also 
which we can't see on this image, but you wanna take a look at the common bile duct and um, assess the diameter. If the uh, common bile duct is dilated greater than four millimeters, then that is a um, dilated CBD. And it is important to note that for every decade over 40, that you add one millimeter for each decade. So a patient who is 50 years old, their upper limit of normal for the common bile duct um, is five millimeters, where a patient who is 60 is six millimeters and so on and so forth. And then also think about um, and consider Another sign is that if the patient has a sonographic Murphy sign, so when you're examining the right upper quadrant, if the patient has um, increased tenderness when you are, or excuse me, increased pain when you are examining the right upper quadrant and pressing in with that um, ultrasound probe where they have arrest of inspiration, then that is a positive sonographic Murphy sign. Another important um, ultrasound to get used to doing when a patient comes in with abdominal pain is taking a look at the patient's aorta, right? So in certain scenarios, aortic dissection or enlarging aortic aneurysms present as abdominal pain. I've even seen a patient come in with no pain and just complain of constipation and they have an enlarging abdominal aorta. So it's important to keep aortic, aortic pathology high on your differential and always consider it for patients with any type of intra-abdominal complaint. So this image shows an enlarged aorta and you can see that um, the aorta is way greater than three centimeters, which is the upper value of um, normal for the aorta. So if the intrathoracic or intra-abdominal aorta is dilated beyond three centimeters, then that is an aneurysm. If you're looking at the iliacs, then 1.5 centimeters is the upper limit of normal for the diameter of the iliacs. Greater than five centimeters has a high likelihood of rupture. So you wanna make sure if you're seeing this on your bed outside ultrasound, you are moving fast, you are calling vascular surgery stat, you are constantly assessing that patient's vital signs to make sure that this obvious aortic aneurysm isn't actually rupturing and you're you know, cross-matching the patient for blood, you're prepared to give Esmolol if the patient is hypertensive or tachycardic um, <clears throat> to get their uh, myocardial demand down. You're making sure that you're moving fast because this is a patient, if they're having pain, it's high likelihood that they have um, <clears throat> ruptured their, their aorta and they're going to become, become unstable quickly if they aren't already. And then lastly, um, one of the imaging studies that you may consider getting in a patient with abdominal pain, which a lot of times patients with abdominal pain do end up getting is a CT scan. So some people call it the donut of truth in the ED, but the CAT scan is used um, to diagnose a variety of intra-abdominal pathologies. And here we can see um, we're pointing to the right lower quadrant and this image shows an inflamed appendix. So this patient has appendicitis. So very rarely in the ED are you ever going to order an MRI of the abdomen or an MRCP or ERCP because that, those won't be studies that you'll be able to readily get in the ED. <clears throat> but if you're at a large academic center, you may be able to order it and it may be necessary for certain patients. So really for patients who, for some reason, can't get a CT scan, but you really need it to confirm a diagnosis. Um, MRIs of the abdomen are often used for pregnant patients. So if a patient who is pregnant comes in with right lower quadrant pain and you have clinical concern for appendicitis, but their workup is kind of equivalent it, but the workup is equivocal and you get an ultrasound of the abdomen and that doesn't show the appendix, then you need to move forward with getting an MRI of the abdomen. So it's important for everyone in medicine, particularly emergency medicine physicians, to examine their own biases before and when they treat patients. 
Implicit and explicit biases can impact our approach to evaluating and treating patients, which can have detrimental effects on someone's health <clears throat> in the form of misdiagnosis and mistreatment. Not everyone who presents to the emergency department receives the same treatment, which also includes not getting the same workup. A recent study published in the April 2020 issue of the American Surgeon found disparities in workups for patients who presented to the ED with acute abdominal pain. The study found that ED physicians were one third and half as likely to rate having a high index of suspicion for acute intra-abdominal pathology in Black and Latinx patients, respectively, in comparison to white patients. In turn, the study found that my, my minority patients received less CT scans overall. Based on the study findings, you have to consider how many diagnoses were missed given the lack of advanced imaging. As we discussed earlier, 25 to 40% of patients who present to the ED with abdominal pain never receive a specific diagnosis as their workups are either negative or they were worked up incorrectly or results were equivocal. It is this high rate of nonspecific diagnosis in combination with the potential for chronicity that can leave patients with abdominal pain particularly vulnerable to implicit biases. You have to think about how these biases impact how you deliver care. For patients who present to the ED either weekly or multiple times a week with certain symptoms and negative workups, you have to start thinking about, did you miss something? Was, is there a misdiagnosis going on here? And the patient has a pathology that no doctor has come up with yet? Or is this a diagnosis that may lack lab or imaging findings such as myocardial angina or inflammatory bowel syndrome? So now that you have performed your history and physical and have results back, hopefully you have a diagnosis for your patient. Your treatment plan will depend on the diagnosis, but it may include analgesics, antacids, antibiotics, and for the doctors of osteopathic medicine, osteopathic manipulative medicine. When we are discussing abdominal pain, we always wanna think about the analgesics. So in this lecture, we were discussing abdominal pain, and for patients, pain is the main reason that most patients come into the ED. So treating the presenting symptom, which is usually for most patients pain, needs to be done quickly after the patient gets to the ED. And you also need to reassess the, reassess the patient's level of pain often. Some options for treating pain for patients with abdominal pain include a GI cocktail. So this can be kind of an you know, a mix of medications that you like. I typically like to start with an H2 blocker, such as famotidine, add some Maalox, and sometimes I give viscous lidocaine as well, and plus or minus a proton pump inhibitor, so pantoprazole. You do have to be mindful and careful when you're giving viscous lidocaine to patients because it can, for some patients, promote aspiration. So you should be very careful when you're giving this medication. Some departments now have IV acetaminophen. If a patient is tolerating food by mouth or, you know, solids, then you can give PO Tylenol as well. You want to also consider IV or IM NSAIDs. IV or IM ketamine, a lot of facilities are now allowing ketamine for pain control and it is very effective. And then in nephrolithiasis, IV lidocaine has a lot of good um, effectiveness as well. And then once you've started to use a multimodal approach of a GI cocktail, maybe some acetaminophen, toradol, what have you, so a mixture of these medications, and if the pain, patient is still not having any relief in their symptoms, you want to consider giving opioids. I know in emergency medicine, we try to avoid opioids, and we rightfully should, but if a patient is having severe abdominal pain, you want to make sure that you are controlling their pain, and sometimes the best way to do that is through opioids, so you want to consider your IV morphine, hydromorphone, whatever. 
paramedics. So oftentimes, in addition to pain, patients with abdominal pain are coming in with nausea and vomiting. So you want to consider medication that, that you can give for these symptoms. So selective serotonin, 5-HT3 antagonists, IV or IM antidopaminergics, topical capsaicin, heating packs, and held isopropyl alcohol. These are all things that you can use that act, act as antiemetics. I personally usually give either PO or IV Odansetron, I start out with that, and then I kind of go from there. Does a patient need metoclopramide? Does the patient need Haldol? If a patient is coming in with gastroparesis, I really like topical capsaicin. It seems to work for some patients pretty well. You can also try using heating packs to the abdomen. Um, and there has been mixed evidence on whether or not um, inhaled isopropyl alcohol actually helps with anti-emetics and being an anti-nausea um, treatment. And some studies have shown that it's better than placebo. Other more recent studies have shown that it's not quite better to placebo, but I usually use it as an, ad, an adjunct and as a bridge to other medications. So if myself and maybe, and obviously my nursing colleagues are working on getting IV line in a patient who's, you know, acutely nauseous and they're vomiting so much. If, if a patient can tolerate, I usually open up a alcohol swab and let the patient sniff that until we can get some IV medication into them to help with their uh, nausea and vomiting. For patients who present with an infectious etiology or they have fever and you're concerned for an infection, you wanna consider making sure that you're giving antibiotics that cover against anaerobes, gram negative and gram positive bugs. So for abdominal pain, you usually wanna think about giving a fluoroquinolone or a tetracycline in appropriate populations. Good go-tos for broad spectrum coverage. I really like a third or fourth generation cephalosporin with metronidazole. Um, other combinations that um, I tend to use a lot are unison, which um, is ampicillin and sulbactam, or zosin, which is pepercillin and tazobactam. So you have a lot of options for antibiotic coverage, but you want to make sure that you are treating the appropriate bugs. If you're concerned for pseudomonas, then you want to make sure you're delivering something with anti-pseudomonal coverage. So you probably want to reach for a fourth generation cephalosporin in addition to um, <clears throat> in addition to your metronidazole. If you're concerned for MRSA, then you want to make sure that you're adding on vancomycin. And so we did discuss racial and ethnic disparities in terms of how it can affect how you work up a patient, we have not yet talked about how this may impact management of a patient and it'd be remiss to do so. So minority patients are less likely to receive timely and appropriate pain management in comparison to white patients. These disparities have been well documented in several emerging conditions such as long bone fractures, myocardial ischemia, and abdominal pain is no ex exception. A retrospective review of over 20,000 adults who presented with abdominal or back pain to two large tertiary EDs found that white patients were more likely than non-white patients to receive analgesics of any kind and opiates. Disparities also exist when treating pediatric patients. Results from Johnson et, et al.'s study using National Hospital Ambulatory Medical Care Survey data showed that, that Black pediatric patients were half as likely to be administered any analgesic in comparison to white patients when presenting with abdominal pain. Disparities don't only exist when it comes to race, ethnicity, but also gender. <clears throat> A study performed by Chen et al. found that women have been found to receive less analgesia, less opioid analgesia, and wait longer times for administration of analgesia than patients who present to the ED, than male patients who present to the ED with abdominal pain. So just to Recap, we've now discussed how you should 
gather your history when approaching a patient with abdominal pain. Things that you should consider when performing your physical exam and different findings that you should be looking for. So specific findings of pathognomonic diseases. And you should also be considering how you're going to work up your patient and including how you're going to treat the patient and manage their symptoms. So again, some of the can't miss abdominal pain diagnoses include aortic dissection, small bowel obstruction, mesenteric ischemia, myocardial infarction, and ruptured ectopic pregnancy. For a patient presenting to the ED with abdominal pain, you always wanna consider aortic dissection. So the classic picture um, that's always included on boards of crushing, ripping, tearing chest pain, unequal pulses, hypertensive on one side, hypotensive on another arm is usually not found in real life when patients present, but you wanna know those classic sign and symptoms for your boards. But in general, I think about aortic dissection for almost every single abdominal pain, um, patient with abdominal pain that comes into the ED. It doesn't always have to be the correct diagnosis, but I should at least be thinking about it. I have a much higher index of suspicion for aortic dissection if the patient has unilateral flank pain, if they have unstable vitals, if they're having hematuria, I'm thinking if they're hypertensive or have a history of an aortic aneurysm or they are currently a smoker or, or are a former smoker, I always think about aortic dissection on the list. So some of the findings that you're going to want to look for when you're working up a patient is performing a bedside ultrasound to look for an aortic aneurysm or signs of aortic dissection, such as a dissection flap. You're going to want to look at your labs to see if there's any um, elevation in troponin, because sometimes that can indicate an aortic dissection. And then if you have high suspicion that the patient coming in with abdominal pain is actually having an aortic dissection, you want to make sure that you mobilize your surgical um, vascular surgical colleagues quickly and that you are treating this patient quickly and making sure that they get up to the OR soon, sooner rather than later. For a patient who presents with abdominal pain and you're concerned for small bowel obstruction, you want to consider getting an upright x-ray, right? We saw that x-ray where the patient had dilated loops of bowel, they had air fluid levels, so you'll, you would be concerned for small bowel obstruction. For these patients, you want to make sure that you're controlling their pain quickly. You want to get labs started. You probably want to put in a nasogastric tube, so an NG tube, to decompress their abdomen. And again, you want to call your surgical colleagues sooner rather than later. Similar to mesenteric ischemia, usually these patients have an exam that is out of proportion, so pain out of proportion to their exam. This patient, usually the patient has a very tender abdomen, they're peritonitic. The patient may have a history of atrial fibrillation or um, some type of coagulopathy to uh, precipitate mesenteric ischemia. When you're Doing your laboratory workup, you may notice that the patient has a leukocytosis or a lactic acidosis, which is a lactate greater than two. Again, for these patients, you want to get your surgical colleagues on board sooner rather than later and consider um, giving uh, analgesics, antibiotics, and sometimes even anticoagulation. For patients with presenting with abdominal pain and you're concerned that this is masquerading as a, um, as a myocardial infarction, you want to consider making sure that you get an EKG right away. You may want to do a bedside echo. You also want to consider when you're ordering your labs, in addition to your CBC, your CMP, that you're ordering a troponin. Maybe you need a BMP um, so that you can start uh, narrowing down your differential and really assessing, is this patient coming in with abdominal pain, have an acute STEMI. So you want to make sure that you get that EKG right away and you don't wait for that. And then lastly, the last can't miss diagnosis is ruptured ectopic pregnancy. So for patients who 
again, have functioning um, ovaries and uterus, you have to be concerned that if they have a pregnancy, a positive pregnancy test and they're early on in their pregnancy, haven't had any imaging, um, you have to be concerned that the pregnancy was never intrauterine and that this patient now has a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. Again, this is a emergent condition. Sometimes the patient will present with unstable vitals, so you need to stabilize the patient. You wanna get analgesics on board. Um, you may need to get antibiotics on board. And again, you wanna call your surgical colleagues, would be, which would be your OBGYN colleagues, but you wanna call them right away to get them on board for this patient. And then just reiterating our common abdominal pain diagnoses. So cholecystitis, we talked about how, um, what, acute cholecystitis would look like on the ultrasound, what physical exam findings you may notice, appendicitis, we talked about pathognomonic um, physical exam findings for appendicitis. We also discussed a little bit about diverticulitis, a little about pancreatitis, gastritis, GERD, colitis, UTI, STIs. So these are all diagnoses that you wanna make sure that you are considering when a patient presents with abdominal pain. So in summary, I always like to um, make sure that you think that when you're seeing a patient in the ED, you make sure to remember that vitals are vital. As with every patient who comes into the ED, but especially patients who have abdominal pain, you wanna be, be performing a thorough physical exam. So that in includes examining the skin, palpating the abdomen, and performing a chaperoned and approved by the patient genital urinary exam. You don't wanna wait for a CT if you don't have to. You wanna make sure that you are using your bedside ultrasound skills. And if, you, if needed, you can add um, upright chest or abdominal x-rays to make, your, make and confirm your diagnosis. And lastly, you wanna make sure that you're treating the patient's pain early and you're reassessing a patient's pain level often because things can change. And again, if a patient comes in stable and then their vitals become unstable, then you're starting to think about different diagnoses and it, it also hastens you to make a diagnosis quicker. <clears throat> and lastly, don't forget about those five can't miss abdominal pain diagnoses that we discussed, aortic dissection, small bowel obstruction, mesenteric ischemia, myocardial infarction, and ruptured ectopic pregnancy. If you have any questions, have any concerns, if you want any more information about emergency medicine, or hopefully you wanna join the JEDI section of AEM, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. You can find my email here, kristenjsmith at gmail.com or you can find me on social media, on IG or Twitter. Thank you so much for listening to this talk. Good luck with your emergency medicine career.